for those of you who aren't um, able to make it in person today. So it's important to start with a bit of background for why we're here today. Uh, for more than two months now, Iranians have been challenging the government's authoritarian, patriarchal, and ethnocentric rule by facilitating mass protests on streets, in schools, and on university campuses. These protests were galvanized by the death of a 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman named Jina Amini, popularly known by her Persian name Mahsa. On September 13th, Amini was arrested by Iran's uh, so-called morality police in Tehran for allegedly not wearing uh, hijab in accordance with uh, government standards. On September 16th, Amini died after falling into a coma while in police custody, with eyewitnesses reporting that she was beaten and sustained head trauma while in detention. Since then, people in Iran have staged multiple protests and political actions in public spaces, calling for Zan Zendigi Ozadi, in English, Women, Life, Freedom, inspired by the original Kurdish feminist slogan, Jen Jian Azadi, even as they have been confronted with brutal suppression from state security forces. While the protests have emerged across numerous Iranian cities and have grown to include different struggles and demands, the severity of state violence has been particularly pronounced towards minoritized communities who reside in the borderlands of Iran, Kurdistan, Khuzestan, and Sistan Baluchistan provinces that have historically faced state repression, economic hardships, and whose communities have long struggled for greater linguistic, educational, and cultural autonomy from the state. As of November 15th, 2022, more than 15,000 protesters have been arrested, more than 300 people have been killed in the protests, and more than 50 children are among those killed by security forces, including 17-year-old Abul Faz Oydin Zadeh, 17-year-old Nika, Shah Karami, 16-year-old Sarina Esmail Zadeh, 16-year-old Asra Panahi, 14-year-old Sefer Mahsudi, and 9-year-old Kian Pirfalak, among many more. In light of the ongoing protests and political demands that they're putting forward, we wanted to come together to consider this moment from our collective experiences as scholars and educators with personal, political, and intellectual commitments to Iran. We will discuss the larger historical struggles that these protests are connected to, as well as how they're unfolding and taking shape within educational and youth spaces in Iran. An important aim for us then is to collectively reflect on what is important for young people's learning about this moment and what educators can consider in engaging with these protests in their own teaching and learning. Thank you, Ruzda John, for that context and introduction. Um, I have to say I'm really, really um, honored and excited to be in conversation with this amazing group of scholars and educators um, who will be introducing as they speak in a little bit. Um, my name is Shirin Busuri and I'm also a co-moderator of the panel. Um, and I wanted to build on what Ruzbe shared and briefly say a little bit more about why we decided to organize a webinar focused on educators, families, and young people. <clears throat> As Ruzbe mentioned, the current uprisings are intersectional and involve many sectors of Iranian society, spanning all parts of the country, as well as Iran's diaspora. Young people, women, and queer folks are also playing a lead role in the uprising, which many have commented on and I'm sure we'll dig into collectively today. Um, while children and young people outside Iran, whether Iranian or non-Iranian, are witnessing this historic moment, they are not often the imagined audience for political discourse and pedagogical discussion around what is taking shape in Iran. So that was kind of a prime reason why we wanted to create space for this dialogue. I will also say that in addition to our roles as educators, we are parents who are thinking hard about how we talk about these events with our children, recognizing how historical moments like this can shape the sense of consciousness and possibility among a whole generation. We also know that many educators and families have been asking for resources. And although we will really likely scratch the surface today, I just wanna be clear, we could probably do 10 hours on this, if not more. We do wanna offer some resources and websites up front. So I'm actually gonna put those into the chat um, so folks can start to dig in. These are just a few resources that I think have been helpful for us and others might have more to add. And in the coming weeks and months, I know folks are working, including some of the people here on sharing more resources. So I hope we can share more as well. 
Um, we do have two kind of key goals in mind today in terms of learning from our panelists. One of them is that we asked everyone to think about this, sharing what they think is important about the substantive issues um, shaping these movements from their kind of scholarly and educational perspectives. And the second is, is we asked everyone to think about the pedagogies that can support children and young people's sense making around these movements as well. Um, and I think it's important to say that we think about pedagogy in at least two ways. One is the what of pedagogy, the content, the meaningful contextual information and histories that are required to engage with Iran in productive and complex ways. And the second, and sometimes even more important, is the how of pedagogy. Um, and I think the how references kind of the attention to qualities of mediation and facilitation and the carefulness and creativity of engaging young people, both in critical social analysis and imagination. Um, lastly, kind of building on this, I'll say that I think we see these dialogues and teach-ins as not only a space to talk about transnational solidarity, but a place to practice it. Um, and to think about people to people connections, young people in Iran to young people around the world connections, rather than allowing our relationships and dialogues with one another to always be mediated and constrained by nation states and their interests and agendas. Um, over the last two months, we have seen many powerful forms of expressing solidarity with Iranian people from Afghanistan, Palestine, Sudan, Argentina, just to name a few, particularly among women and women's organizations, as well as many folks in the United States, Europe, and other Western contexts. There's also a long history of change making and revolutionary activity in Iran that has engaged in a global dialogue, especially with other contexts in the global south, and I think the current movements are no exception. So with that, I'll hand it back to Ruzbe, who will tell us a little bit about the format of today. Yeah, thank you, Shirin. Um, yeah, as, as Shirin mentioned, rather than really to try to enumerate what uh, educators should do, we, we want to invite you to wrestle with us about these ideas and possibilities for intergenerational sense-making. And uh, there are three things that we want to offer as starting points for this work. Uh, one, the need to contextualize. Two, uh, historicize. And, and third, to resist grand narratives. Uh, because working with narrative is messy and complex and deserves care. And what we uh, want to really try to hold on to at this moment is the importance of complicating flat either or narratives that reduce the complexities and intersections of these protests down to a single issue frame or frames that project our own readings or political desires onto these happenings. And the importance of doing this is it's how we can shift uh, dominant ways of knowing. And we'll hear uh, more about that from Shirin and our other panelists in, in the remarks. So uh, what we're going to do today um, in terms of our program, first we'll hear from Sara uh, Mokhtari Fox, um, who I have the pleasure of introducing. Uh, Sara is an eighth grade Spanish language arts teacher and union organizer in uh, San Francisco United uh, Unified School District. She also has a history of helping to organize uh, learning environments for youth in the Iranian diaspora. She'll be speaking to the current moment uh, briefly from the perspective of a current K-12 public school teacher of Iranian descent. Uh, after Sara, we'll, we'll hear from Sharzad Mojab. After Shahzad, we'll hear from Catherine uh, Samet, and then uh, I will speak, and Shirin Busuri will um, conclude our program, and from there, we'll open up our Q&A with some questions and dialogue among panelists. And as you're listening, please don't wait to formulate or pose your questions. You can put those in the Q&A box, and we'll return to those and likely try to syn synthesize them once we get to the Q&A at the second half of the session today. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Sara, to please uh, start us off. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so when discussing the perspective of current K-12 educators, we first really need to acknowledge that we are still in a pandemic, and this pandemic has placed incredible pressures on teachers and families and students working within an already challenging public education system. So for educators like myself who are committed to social change and who are trying to be culturally responsive and include you know, current issues in our classrooms, of course, I want to incorporate what's going on in Iran. 
But the reality of education currently is this teacher shortage that we were warned about. Uh, we're living it right now. Uh, in San Francisco Unified, we have over 300 open positions right now, which means teachers like myself are being asked to cover classes on our preps and our additional academic and mental health services are being cut so that those adults could cover classes and this already challenged system that we were <laughs> working in before is worse now and our students needs are much greater. So for those of us who haven't left the profession, we're picking up those pieces that the system is not replacing and we have so much less energy and time to do anything outside of the absolutely necessary, which we know is already a lot. So for something as important to me as Iran and revolution, uh, if I am to incorporate this into my classroom, I, I need to attend to the many layers uh, and the history involved so that my students can have a deep and critical understanding of what's going on today. And with so many components, it, it's just, it's really hard. And I know other educators must be feeling similar tensions wanting to address the current issues while already being incredibly overburdened, especially in areas with the intense CRT backlash, you know, that's a whole nother level. So for me, what will be helpful as an educator and potentially helpful for others is support in creating accessible content and context that can be plugged into my classes and my lessons. And thinking of accessibility, not only like, you know, uh, delivered in ways that 13 year olds can understand, but that centers the youth participation and leadership of the movements in Iran, because not only is it an Iranian movement, it's a youth led movement, it's a feminist movement, it's an intersectional and intergenerational movement, and our young people really need to know that. Because our young people are very well aware that our current systems are not working, and far too often adults blame this generation for feeling apathetic but we have to look at the world that we're handing them. Like the future can be so daunting. I remember taking my eighth graders once to a city college tour in San Francisco and the sweet little tour guide trying to engage my kids. is like, what do you think about when you think about college and their immediate reactions, student debt, loans, and crippling anxiety, stress. There was, there's nothing about careers or pursuing passions. And that was pre-pandemic. So now we have to incorporate COVID as well as the effects of climate change, for example, the fire seasons that we have in California that did not exist when I was growing up here. We have to incorporate active shooter drills into our annual earthquake and fire drill procedures. This was once an unimaginable level of violence is now something we are preparing our children for instead of preventing. They watch their parents struggle um, with absurd inflation and disrespectful wages for workers. And we have record numbers of homelessness and drug use all surrounding my school community. And yet we blame our kids for feeling apathetic about their futures. But they, they need hope. Young people need hope. And they need to see that people can come together and create worlds that look very different than the one that we are living in today. And young people need to be able to see themselves as, as participating and leading that change alongside with adults that really do care about them and their communities, um, as we're seeing happening today in Iran. So as an Iranian in this diaspora and as a revolutionary, watching these uprisings unfold and continue, you know, is providing me with so much hope. And I really want to provide that hope to my students. So I'm very grateful for this space that we are creating today to try to do that together. Um, and with that, I now have the pleasure of introducing our first panelist. Um, let me get to the bios. Sharsad Mochab is a scholar, teacher, and activist, and internationally known for her work on the impact of war, displacement, and violence of women's learning and education. She's a professor of women and gender studies and education at the University of Toronto, and her most recent books are Marxism and Migration, Women of Kurdistan, Historical and Biographical Study, and Revolutionary Learning, Marxism, Feminism, and Knowledge. A unique feature of her work is making knowledge accessible to the public through the use of arts as storytelling, dance, drama, painting, and film. Her most recent work, No Woman's Land, the dance project to capture the experience of wet refugee women of sexual violence. And she has archived and curated the experience of women in prison in the Middle East on the website the Art of Resistance in the Middle East. Please welcome Shahzad. Oh. 
Oops. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so in the spirit of uh, exactly, you know, uh, what uh, Shirin and, and Ruzbeh mentioned in terms of, of the uh, pedagogy and um, also accessibility, I thought that I'm, I'm gonna do two things uh, simultaneously. One is a method that I will use, a pedagogical method that I will use, and then also a, a sort of, of, of a using this concept, but uh, I don't mean it in, in that way, an object, something to analyze, to bring our audience and learners closer to the issue. I think that you have heard over and over again, and in fact, Ruzbe also started by um, giving us a version of this sentence. This is now a, a standard media sentence that reads on September 13th, 2022, Mahsa Jina Amini, a 20 year old Iranian Kurdish woman, was arrested for improper veiling by the morality police and was brutally killed while in custody on September 16, 2022. You realize that I have uh, put, um, you know, made in, in red fonts and, and, and underlined certain concepts and words in this sentence. And this is what I'm, I'm going to talk about, how to talk about these uh, issues. I think that in this one sentence, we can trace the continuity of resistance despite a state structure, gender, and national oppression, and the complex set of security, militarized surveillance of patriarchal, theocratic, coercive state apparatus. So all of this can be unpacked in, in, in this one headline news. Let me start by the question of the national oppression by walking you through the first uh, uh, red underlined concept, Mahsa in parentheses, Gina. So her parentheses name by itself signifies the national oppression. Gina means giving life in Kurdish and her grave on her grave, the inscription is dearest Gina, you shall not die, your name will be a symbol, a code. So this means that Kurds have uh, historically been denied the right to have Kurdish names to, uh, uh, for, for their children. And it is common to have two names, a Kurdish name at home, Gina, and an administrative name, Mahsa. As is argued by several Kurdish feminist scholars, the erasure of Gina's Kurdish name and identity and dismissing the likely relationship of her Kurdishness to the fatal violence that she was subjected to reveals deeper patterns of erasure of, of the Kurds and, and what they have experienced since the coming into power of the Islamists forces. So what is this pattern? The pattern is, is that Kurdish territory uh, from 1980s is a militarized zone. And as we are talking, actually, this is happening again for the first time since the uprising in Iran. The city of Ahmadabad is now under the, the tanks and, and, and heavy machinery of, of, of the military forces. So one um, trace is that this uh, militarization zone that has been created in, in the, the, the country. The second one is the economic and cultural suppression with, with a assimilationist politics towards Kurdish language and culture. While Kurds constitute 10% of the population, but close to 50% of political prisoners in Iran are Kurds. And in recent weeks, most of, of the Kurdish women environmental activists have been arrested. But they have joined some of the high profile cases that it is not known to us. One is Zahra Mohammadi, a 30 year old Kurdish language teacher 
and uh, on July 2020 was sentenced to 10 years in prison on the charge of um, traveling in, in different villages in, in the Kurdish areas and then teaching Kurdish language to school children. And she was, um, and, and she's accused of, of being involved in political activities against national security. So her sentence was later re reduced to five years and, and, and um, uh, starting on, on January 8, 2022, and she's in, in prison right now. The second one is Zainab Jalalian. And that who was arrested in uh, March 2008. She is the longest women political prisoner serving in, in prison right now. And both uh, Zahra and, and Zainab's, uh, they have been accused of, of also their membership in the uh, party of Free Life of Kurdistan or Pejak which is a banned Kurdish group. And, and so ironically that this is slogan, women, life, freedom, also is the slogan of, of this banned political group. And, and that's why that, I mean, we can have a session on unpacking women, life, freedom as a pedagogical sort of, of, of way of, of doing it. I'm not gonna go into details on, on in, in this. Now, the second, uh, words uh, that are uh, underlined are improper veiling and morality police. It is important to pay attention to the sequencing of the uh, legalization of what I call gender apartheid social cultural political structure that, that was established soon after the 1979 revolution. And paying attention to this process of historicization as was discussed is also very important. So on March 8, 1979, the proclamation of compulsory veiling was, was announced by Ayatollah Khomeini. But it became a law in 1983. 1983 is a very important year because this coincides with the closure of the universities under the rubric of Islamic Cultural Revolution it started in 1980 and the opening of universities was three years later, 1983. So the veiling became a law because of the return of, of, of uh, uh, female students to campuses and, and also because the power of, of, of the Islamic regime was consolidated. But the criminalization of, of the sort of improper veiling started in 1990s. And it was on, on 2005 that the High Council of Cultural Revolution during the, the presidency of, of Khatami announced the law of, this is a sort of a directive of chastity and unveiling, and, and which increased the enforcement and legalization of, of, of the, uh, the veiling to a totally different level. And therefore, in order to implement that and enforce it, this whole process of securitization and militarization of a women's body began through this notion of the morality police, which I don't think that is, is a good translation. I prefer that if we use sort of Islamic religious police and or, or guidance patrol, and, and, and which are also, um, some people are also called vice squad. So it was in 2005 that it was established and under article 683 of Iran's Islamic penal code, the penalty for a woman not wearing the hijab consists of imprisonment for and, and from 10 days to two months, a fine and maybe also lashed up to 74 times. Starting in January, 2018, there was a shift in the punishment of women improper failing, in particular in the cosmopolitan city of, of, of Tehran. And this shift is rooted in two circumstances. 
One is the rising number of women who revolted, started revolting against the hijab law. And according to the interior minister report in 2014, 220,000 women were taken to police stations to sign a statements that they have violated the hijab law and, and they are not gonna repeat it again. Overall, close to 4 million Iranians received warnings and quote unquote guidance because they failed to follow the Islamic dress code. It is also important to note that this includes men too, because of, of their haircut, their style, or women's makeup, or women's bodily posture, loud laughter in, 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 in public, and, and so on and so forth. So, and, and this sort of a, a vice squads, they were, uh, you know, using their, their uh, stationed in, in public places, shopping centers, the squares, subway stations, and they would arrest women and, and give them um, sort of, of, of um, fines or, or uh, warning. But what is happening, which is very important, and it's actually, it was the, the courageous act of Jinal's family to make what happened to their daughter public was that in these detention centers, they have created what they call religious re-education centers, which means that they, the women have to go through a process of being re-indoctrinated into the Islam and the rules of, of chastity and, and, and veiling and, and all of that. Now, I want to sort of expand our discussion here. If I have uh, a couple of more minutes, uh, uh, Rosebeth? Sure, I think we can do two or three more, but I'm Thank you. So what I want to mention here, which is, I, I think that, uh, again, pedagogically is, is, is important. Veiling is more than a piece of cloth covering women's body and, and, and hair. It has legal implication. Legally, it is about structuring the entire society on the basis of Sharia law, which is part of, of, of the constitution, article four of, of the constitution. And it, it, therefore, it is about gender segregation or gender apartheid. It is about chastity. It is about religious morality, sexual desires, family relations, including marriage, divorce, custody, inheritance, and so on and so forth. So these are legal ramifications of it. Physically, it is partitioning public spaces, schools, universities, public transportations, workplaces, hospitals, parks, recreational facilities, sports facilities are all divided on, on the way that the um, gender relations is, is defined. Symbolically, it is also about control and disciplining of women's body and sexuality. It's about the control of sexual desires, but most importantly, it is also about suppression of bodily freedom, freedom of thought, academic freedom, freedom of association. And for us, importantly, it's about the um, uh, sort of banning any kind of, of critical mode of learning, critical thinking, and, and critical way of, of, of inquiry. So the second reason uh, that I wanna mention that what is happening right now is, is that since 2009, uh, which was the, uh, the, the period of, of, of the green, uh, so-called the green revolt, social unrest and then social protest by women, workers, students, teachers, nurses, doctors, writers, environmentalists, peace activists, in other words, every body, every, every person in, in, in the country has been unceasing. And, and uh, daily sort of resistance is a, is a very important uh, concept for us to, to discuss. And this is related to the rise of unemployment, 
especially among the youth. And especially when you uh, think about that of, of, of close to 86 million population of Iran, 60 million of, of the population are, are under the age of, of 30. So poverty, inflation, the hardship of, of, of sanctions, all of this has created an economic condition for, for uh, protests and resistance. And, and between 2017 and 2018, we had different forms of women's resistance, the, the very famous girls of revolutionist streets and, and many spontaneous acts of, of defiance. 2019, we had price hike and, 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 and also the shutdown of the Ukraine International Airlines flight S752. So you can see that this is not a sort of, of, of a, um, a one time um, revolt that it is happening, but it is the culmination of many grievances of, of Iranian population. Now, what is happening is, is, is that I want to mention that the reason that women are, are leading this revolution, not only because of, of, of all the conditions, economic, political, and, and, and uh, bodily freedom of, of women have been under the uh, suppression of this regime since it came into power in, in, in 43, but also the resistance of, of women has been um, um, continuous. And, and for example, right now, the, in the context of, of, of higher education, um, more than 60% of women are, are uh, entering in, into universities. Actually, in, in the latest uh, data, uh, the um, uh, female students' uh, enrollment um, in, in higher education was close to 64%. I think that as educators, and I will consider myself a radical um, uh, educator, um, I wanna think about that um, when we teach about uh, the condition of Iran, it is important to connect and understand Iran in relation to the rest of, of, of the world and in the understanding in the, in the global context which means that uh, the starting point for us should not be on the question of identity, authenticity, or culture. All of, of these things cannot be separated from the larger patriarchal capitalist and imperialist structures of power, which these are social, political, and economic relations that connect us all. So this connectivity and relationality is, is very important. So Iran is a, could be used and should be used, I think, as a framing for understanding forms and, and mechanisms of, of oppression, racial, linguistics, sexual, national oppression that connects uh, all of us globally. And also as a framing of understanding exploitation, as Sarah mentioned, the question of poverty unemployment, class divisions, neoliberalism of, of, of educational system, privatization, and student debts, and, and, and unemployment especially with, with numerous degrees but, but no jobs. So Iran is a framing to understand the relationship, the interdependency of also fundamentalism and capitalist imperialism. These are not contradictions. They are uh, cohere with each other, collude with, with, with each other, and then create the condition that is, for example, the banning on, on, on abortion in, in the US, the rise of, of, of fascism and, and patriarchal uh, relations in, in Europe. These are all connected in, in terms of, of our understanding of interdependency of fundamentalism and capitalism in, in imperialism. So to help us understand the internal Iran, yeah, I mean, yeah, if we frame these things, if we, we frame Iran, we can also better understand the internal global dynamic 
of, of capitalist imperialism that, that is being mostly used in the educational sector under the euphemism of globalization. I mean, globalization, yes, it is happening, but we need to understand the, the, the sort of the condition of, of, of it. We also need to overcome simplif simplification of what is happening in Iran. It's not only a cultural matter, so we should avoid culturalization of, of the situation in Iran, and then also dehistoricization and depoliticization. Now to end, I am uh, going to sort of, 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 I feel that compelled to reiterate Kienga Yamanta Taylor's call for solidarity when she says solidarity is standing in unity with people, even when you have not personally experienced their particular oppression, but understanding it in terms of, of, of its politics, its history, its culture, and its connectivity is very important. So I think that even our understanding of, of solidarity needs theory and learning. And I really hope that we can use the case of, of Iran in forging and expanding our theory and, and our learning. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Shahzad. Um, that, was, that was fantastic. I would like to now um, introduce uh, Catherine Samet who is our next speaker. Um, Catherine is an Associate Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of California, Irvine. She is the author of Axis of Hope, Iranian Women's Rights Activism, Rights Activism Across Borders, published by the University of Washington Press in 2019. Her book explores the discourses, practices, methods, organizational cultures, and transnational networks of Iranians, uh, Iranian women's rights activists in Iran and the United States. Dr. Samet also serves as a co-editor of Jadalia's Iran page. Thank you, Catherine. If now that I invite you to please uh, take the floor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to Ruth Bay and Shireen for organizing this webinar. I have, you know, in the last three months, so appreciated the opportunity to be in conversation with others. Um, to think and learn together as we navigate this incredible, incredible moment. Um, I just think, you know, despite the ongoing state violence, imprisonment, and death, the fact that we're into the third month of this sustained <clears throat> feminist uprising is incredible. And I know we all remain deeply inspired by what appears to be, you know, perhaps the first feminist revolution in the history of revolutions as something I think we'll be talking about and thinking about for a long time. So, um, you know, I, I'm so grateful to Sara, your comments, and Sharsad, your comments. Um, and some, some of what I say might be some kind of rep repetition or, or crossover. But I wanted to sort of make, you know, as we've all been saying, there's just so much to talk about, but maybe three points, um, many of which have been made. But one, History matters, as we've been saying, and so I think um, this this opportunity, webinars like this, to try to think and talk with some really deep nuance is so important. Since we're so um, we we feel so much pressure in the classroom, you know, and there's such limited time to to think historically, to 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 think with the kind of nuance, um, and we often have to make really difficult choices about what we're emphasizing. Um, but one thing that has been emphasized, and I think it just bears repeating over and over again, Iran has a deep, long history of feminist struggle, right? Dating at least as far back as the early 20th century with the Constitutional Revolution, um, but many diverse and sustained feminist struggles throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. And I think it's important to acknowledge how deeply and broadly supported the revolution of 1979 was, how much feminist and women's participation. Uh, there was, it was a huge majority against a small and powerful elite. Um, and I think one of the legacies of the revolution was um, the creation of many programs and services that really dramatically increased the, the sort of well being and life circumstances for many people literacy rates, life expectancy, reduced birth and fertility rates of women, 
um, and as Sharsad said, the, the increase of uh, the percentage of women in universities. So right before the revolution, average births for women were around seven. By 1985, they dropped to 5.6 and by 2000 went down to two and have remained kind of consistently at that level. And, and since women's and girls' bodies are so central to this uprising, I think it's really important to acknowledge that the kind of, you know, last several decades have um, improved many, not all, but many people's life chances. Now, of course, of course, as Sharzad laid out, these imp improvements were exacted at a very high price um, for women and many others, and that that price was and remains um, a, a discriminatory legal structure. So I think, you know, pedagogically thinking about the fact that bodies and women's bodies and gendered regimes of uh, societal political participation um, are continuous through different regimes. And, you know, what, what are the links that we can make about how does gender and the kind of structuring of bodies and the, the expectations of bodies come up and so um, uh, I think that's something that we we need to kind of think about. Um, now it, it's because of the, the kind of presence of women in society, I argue that um, that campaigns like the One Million Signatures campaign, which emerges in 2006 um, and is a local and transnational campaign to end discriminatory law against women, um, this this campaign was really interesting because it said, look, um, we're gonna draw on the promises of the revolution, right? For women's equality that became uh, understood and, and enacted in gender differentiated discriminatory ways. But we're gonna draw on that promise and say, look, this is, um, we're, we're trying to hold the state accountable for, uh, for this kind of contradiction. The, the fact that this discriminatory legal structure actually goes against our enormous presence in society, our enormous um, uh, uh, um, uh, constituency, um, our improved life chances, our improved education, our improved participation in society. Um, and the campaign was, was uh, also a kind of consciousness raising effort to say that these discriminatory laws um, not only fail to reflect the society we thought we were participating in, but also are not consistent with Islamic principles um, and Islamic legal principles. So uh, there are many campaigns like this, but this is one interesting example. And, and some of the activists that were involved in this, this campaign are now part of a, a kind of social media activist group called Feminist for Gina, and they are doing some really incredible posts. Um, and while these campaigns were only periodically successful, they nonetheless exerted sustained pressure on the state to address political demands for women's rights. And moreover, they created the kinds of organizational cultures based on deeply feminist visions of social change. And I think that's one kind of continuity to the, to the present moment is what, what is the kind of political vision of how we're, we're together with each other. And I think that's really significant even if, um, uh, in the face of defeat of the campaigns and of, of movements. Um, so uh, women's rights activist Nusheen Ahmadi Khorasani argued, quote, the power of the civil and democratic movement of the Iranian people must come not from blood, clenched fists, bulging veins and zealous revenge seeking, but rather from life affirming, life affirming endurance, persistence and thoughtfulness, end quote. And this is something that has been really interesting to me to kind of think about this, um, this different mode of organizing, right? That's, that's about a kind of um, a challenge to the kind of the masculinized, you know, sort of macho uh, um, uh, political style that we also see uh, women challenging. Um, but of course, this is a different historical moment. Um, and this is kind of the second point. Um, and Sharsad laid this out, I think, for us nice, really nicely. Um, the, the last several years have been, we've seen a decline in people's living standards, profound mismanagement of the economy and the COVID pandemic. Um, the kind of squeezing that Sarah is talking about that many people are experiencing all over the place, right? The kind of economic squeezing that sense in which um, uh, the meaning of life itself and the kind of dignity of the body um, is being attacked at many levels. 
Um, and this, you know, coincides with, um, with sanctions, with, uh, again, a failing economy. Um, we've seen massive and significant protests around environmental crises, drying up of rivers. Um, the summer before these protests, there were lots of protests around inflation and pensioners talking about, you know, um, our tables are empty, uh, you know, doing these kind of protests in the street with an empty sofre on the street. Um, women, you know, confronting the Basiji saying, you know, don't you buy oil and rice and chicken or don't you have a body, a body that needs to be sustained. So I think, um, you know, this is, this is a different period and it, it is um, part of why, again, I think woman life freedom has been the sign under which an enormous number of grievances can kind of coalesce and really point to, again, um, uh, uh, a different vision of life. What is the, the life that, that is meaningful and dignified and what does it take for us to have that, right? And, and feminism and gender are at the heart of that. So the struggle against compulsory hijab is one and the same as uh, with the struggle for self-determination of all Iranian people. And I think that's been part of why we've seen such a broad coalition. And I was really struck at the, the very start of these protests, uh, you had a kind of uh, similar refusal of patriarchal authority and gender differentiated citizenship in the, the, um, the news that Russian soldiers were defecting by the hundreds, if not more. And that really struck me as kind of these two global um, points of, young people saying, we, um, we don't wanna uh, uh, live with this kind of militarized patriarchal violence, but we, um, we have a different vision of society. And the third and final point, and I, I need to wrap it up, is that um, the solidarity uh, uh, that's happening inside Iran among different genders, sexualities, um, uh, generations, ethnicities, religions, is also happening transnationally. So feminists from around the world have been inspired um, by this moment and inspired, I think, uh, and this is a really important thing that hopefully we can talk more about. Instead of um, spending a lot of time saying that this, this uh, we are against Islamophobia and authoritarianism, they're bringing that together. They're saying we're against compulsory hijab, not some universal hijab because there is no universal hijab. We're against compulsion of the body, whether that's to, to wear the hijab or to be forced to take it off as in France and the US and India, a kind of Hindu nationalism in India. So Indian feminists have been really strongly making these links. Um, people have been making the link to the kind of control of women's bodies and the abortion ban in the United States. Um, and, and this is a moment, I think, to renew that deep intellectual and political and pedagogical tradition of transnational feminism, to say that all over the world, people are facing similar kinds of, of deprivations of the body, state violence, hunger, environmental crises, existential crises, and, um, and that feminism and the kind of transnational feminist uh, solidarity that tradition has had a different way of kind of uh, building a new world that says we are against uh, imperialism and Western intervention, right? This is not, Iranians will save themselves. This is not about anyone saving them. And we are for connecting this incredible feminist revolutionary struggle to other struggles around the world that are really asking us to think about life itself right, and the incredible attacks on life itself at all of these different levels, and what kind of world can we build that's about love and care and taking care of people, and um, uh, that, I think, is, is the, the debate and discussion that we want to have. What does that world look like? So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm really um, feeling expanded by everybody's comments and the connections that folks are making. I want to also remind um, the audience to feel free to pose your questions in the Q&A. Um, we have a few more speakers and I will transition to introducing Ruzbe, 
um, a little bit more. So Ruzbe Shirazi is Associate Professor of Comparative and International Education at the University of Minnesota. Um, informed by his experience as a former public school teacher, his research and teaching focuses on the everyday processes of secondary and post-secondary education as arenas of cultural production and sociopolitical struggle around questions of nation, belonging, and youth identities. His work on Iranian diasporic educational spaces and knowledge production on Iran within media and educational spaces has appeared in the Journal of Teacher Education, Comparative Education Review, and the Journal of Iranian Studies. Welcome, Rizbe. Great, thank you for that, Shirin. And I just want to echo the, the, the fact that I, I'm really feeling, I'm seeing connections among all of the, the, the points that are being made. And I, I think that this is exactly what uh, we set out to do um, in organizing this webinar in the first place. I'm going to share my uh, screen because I have some images that I'd like people just to consider as um, as I'm speaking. So let me do that if I can take a moment to and I'm hoping that everyone can see that. Is that coming up? Okay, great. So I, I, the point that I kind of want to spend a couple of minutes on now is really how educators and youth have participated in the current protests in Iran. And I think it's important to start by saying that social movements often create their own unique cultural forms and protest repertoires. So in the US and, and beyond, uh, the race fist, for example, has a long history as a symbol of black power and political struggle from the iconic photo of Tommy Smith and John Carlo raising their fists at the 1968 Olympics, uh, to the salute run up by Black Panthers, um, to the massive metal sculpture of the race fist erected in 2020 at the heart of George Floyd Square here in Minneapolis. Uh, these protest practices can support the building of shared meanings within movements among participants, and also work to express central ideas and sentiments to uh, outside audiences. And uh, from the current protests within Iran, there have been several images and practices that have become prominent in the uh, coverage of the protests, as well as in uh, demonstrations of solidarity from um, people outside of Iran. And many of the images that have uh, circulated broadly in media reports and so social media timelines include pictures of women protesting by uh, burning their headscarves uh, or cutting their hair in public, as you can see in these images here. And these political practices have taken off, uh, notably the, the public haircutting, and have been emulated by members of the Iranian diaspora, as well as by non-Iranian celebrities like Juliette Binoche and Marianne Cotillard in France, and Meghan Markle, um, and most recently the Iranian soccer player Saeed Piroman in Dubai, um, pictured at the bottom left, who um, made the gesture of cutting his hair after scoring a goal in a match. And we can debate the, the kind of the depth and the, and the meaningfulness of different fo folks um, making these gestures, but perhaps we can get to that in the, in the Q&A. Iranian um, school children have also contributed significantly to these protest repertoires. Uh, some of the most circulated images from the moment uh, we're in are ones of uh, Schoolgirls in their classrooms without veils, as you can see in this slide, lined up shoulder to shoulder with their backs to the camera, uh, taunting images of uh, current and past Iranian leaders, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini and Khamenei, or facing a chalkboard visible to the viewer with messages uh, of protests written in Persian. And in a viral video uh, from the city of Karaj at the top left, I'm not going to play the video, but there were many unveiled Iranian uh, schoolgirls who are working together to force an official to leave their school grounds, pressuring him towards the school gates, throwing bottles of water at him, and taunting him as B. Sharaf, or someone uh, without honor, as he makes his exit. And it's important to note that in the video, it's an adult staff member who's the one who opens the gate for him to leave. So there is a kind of um, involvement as well, or tacit kind of endorsement of uh, educators uh, as um, young people are expressing their 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 politics, and I and I think these images make it clear that young people in uh, in Iran, in this case high school girls, are actively asserting their political agency 
as political actors who have their own demands and specific critiques. And that's an area that I think more attention and care is needed from those of us outside of Iran to learn from uh, young people in Iran to understand their political meaning making and really resisting the urge to narrate those for them. Their assertions, in my view, are all the more significant precisely because they're happening within the very state institutions that are meant to educate and shape them into desirable national subjects. And so in Iran and beyond, there's something really powerful about seeing uh, school-age children tr transform their learning spaces into sites of political action and contestation. These and other acts of dissent, uh, along with the participation of youth in protests, has led to a violent uh, response by the Iranian government and its security forces. Uh, in uh, English language reporting, the New York Times, for example, this week just published a story on how youth are both heavily involved in protests as young as 14 years old and how um, over now 50 youth have been killed in uh, confrontations with security forces or in police detention. On, uh, as of November 15th, the Times has also documented 23 raids on high schools and cities across Iran where plainclothes militia and intelligence agents interrogate, beat, and search students, or where school authorities themselves have attacked students. And um, the attacks and detention of youth have also galvanized strong public actions by teachers and teacher organizations uh, in Iran. And a collective of Iranian educators known as the Justice Seeking Teachers, or Mualamone Edalat Kha, uh, published a statement on Akhbar Ruz issued uh, two weeks after Amini's death went public, decrying her murder and saying that it posed the beginning to the end of 44 years of destruction. And that unit of time uh, is important here because it references the, the, the regime without naming it, because the Islamic Republic of Iran was established nearly 44 years ago. Another prominent teacher, la uh, Teachers Labor Association in Iran, the Coordinating Council of Iranian Teachers Trade Associations, or the CCITTA, has been documenting many cases of teacher and student involvement and arrests at protests and the government attacks against them on their Twitter feed. In an October 24th statement, the CCITTA declared the following. We know very well that the military, the security, and plainclothes forces are assaulting the schools and educational spaces. During this systematic repression, they have most viciously taken the dear lives of several students and children, from Nika and Sarina to Abul Fazl, Esra Panahi and Ardebil, and 14 students and children from Sistan and Baluchistan, Kerman Shah, Gilan, Mazandaran. The rulers should know that Iranian teachers will not tolerate these atrocities and brutalities. We declare that we are from the people and that the bullets you shoot at people in the streets target our bodies and souls. The student's life is intertwined with our lives, and we cannot focus on the blackboard and ignore how children of this land suffer from gunpowder, fire, and bullets. If the people in society scream, then we are part of this cry for justice too. And it's the support and solidarity and political consciousness of Iranian teachers with respect to their students that I think also deserves more attention, study, and discussion from all of us. Rather than to uh, fulfill this role of, of being their voice and trying to narrate their demands, perhaps what's more necessary right now is listening uh, closely to what's happening. Because these educators remind us that they, we as educators are uniquely positioned as political actors to both identify and be identified as political actors. And they remind us of the importance of speaking out and providing support to young people struggling in times of injustice. For as uh, Paulo Ferreira reminds us, washing one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and powerless means to side with the powerful, not to remain neutral. In all of these ways, Iranian educators are teaching us, they're reminding us that education is fertile terrain for political labor and imaginings. Even before Amini's murder, the CCI TTA had been active in calling for strikes and coordinating protests and advocating for better conditions for teachers and students. Indeed, uh, teachers have long been active in Iran's labor movement, staging multiple strikes and protests on behalf of their own working conditions, as well as standing in solidarity with different constituencies in Iran who are making demands upon the state, such as transportation workers, pensioners, contract-based oil workers, nurses, and so on. Um, one of the uh, reasons for this solidarity, I think that's important to mention, is the shared conditions of hardship with 
which Shahzad and Catherine have gestured to already. In the past few years, the purchasing power of Iranians has dramatically declined. Inflation has increased by 50% or more. And this is also exacerbated by the regime of sanctions uh, levied against Iran. Uh, to put this into a more US-based context, in the past year, consider that the US has experienced an inflation rate of 8%. 8% inflation is constraining many families' abilities to pay bills, to pay rent, to buy food, and purchase gasoline, the basic living expenses. We have to ask ourselves what would happen in the US if the present economic pressures were greatly multiplied in intensity and then extended indefinitely, uh, as they have been in Iran. Uh, it's hard to say what would happen, but the pressures exerted by much higher inflation, by the diminished purchasing power, by poor pay and working conditions, uh, the sanctions and ongoing repression and unaccountability on the part of the state are the very conditions that both sharpen political demands and make collective organizing possible. I want to uh, stop here uh, by reiterating that although the political present and protest movement in Iran have to be understood on their own terms, indisputably from the vantage point of Iranians who are confronting the various repressions of the state within the country, it's also important to recognize that the economic and social precarity that Iranian educators and students face, the degraded working conditions and prolonged absence of material support, the lack of dignity that they're uh, confronting, it's not limited by national borders. And these are the pressures that have galvanized teachers to strike in Los Angeles, in Chicago, and in Minneapolis, and in St. Paul. And they're contributing to the educational uh, disparities and teacher shortages and attrition from the profession that Saro talked about um, at the beginning of our session. And these are the connections that are worth also deepening and exploring, because they're the ones that can help us to avoid oversimplifying the protests in Iran and the struggles and demands of the people sustaining them. Thank you. Thank you very much for those deep connections and insights, Ruzbe. Um, I now have the great pleasure of introducing a longtime friend and mentor, uh, Shirin Wusuri, who is an educator, a mother, a writer, associate professor of learning sciences at Northwestern University's School of Education and Social Policy, where she studies the cultural, socio, political, and ethical dimensions of human learning. Uh, her collaborative design work and research centers on learning environments that support young people to develop, question, and expand disciplinary and artistic knowledge in ways that nourish educational dignity and self-determination. And she's particularly concerned with studying the complexities and possibilities of political education and how they take sh shape in micro interaction. So let's welcome Shi. Thank you, Swara, and thank you, everyone. Um, such a powerful set of reflections and analyses that have been shared so far. Um, so as Sara mentioned, I study political education and the relationships between micro and macro forms of political struggle, um, which for me means that I understand learning environments as spaces of historical action and social change. I also get to work with a lot of Iranian youth and families in the diaspora, particularly around questions of identity and learning. Um, and I think it's important to say that I'm the daughter of a leftist who was exiled following the revolution and who believed until the end of his life in the possibility of a just future for Iran. And I'm the mother of a six-year-old who is thinking hard and asking important questions about what we're witnessing there today as tied to her growing understanding of the world. Um, and I think those roles shape my thinking as much as my research does. Um, so I want to speak first as a mother and offer some reflections that may connect with other parents or caregivers in the audience. Um, and I want to kind of do two things, which is offer some guidelines and practices that may be helpful for helping um, particularly Iranian diasporic families and their children's sense making in this moment. And I also want to share some stories from my experience of parenting as tied to my own political upbringing commitments and ongoing growth. Um, and I hope that we have time to maybe pick up this thread as a panel because I'm just going to share one perspective and I'm sure there's lots of important um, perspectives that we might share um, around parenting and caregiving. Um, so I start from the premise that young children are complex thinkers and political actors who are always engaged in sense making. Um, I can't help but share that these days I often think about my own experience as a six year old in 1986 when my family and many other Iranian families were navigating displacement and trauma in the aftermath of the revolution 
and the forms of repression that ensued. Um, I remember paying close attention to what the adults around me were saying, thinking, and feeling in the ways that I now see my daughter doing. Um, I don't think anybody who would come to this webinar holds like the pejorative deficit views of children that are prominent in our society. But I will say that even as somebody who studies this, I am reminded on a daily basis about the depth of their capacities for political analysis and imagination, as well as, well as our role um, as adults in working to understand and support their sense making and emotional well being, especially as they grow to recognize and experience various forms of injustice. Um, so I'm going to share a few images just for this piece of the talk. So give me a moment. Um, okay, hopefully folks can see that. Yes. All right. Um, so Earlier in the fall, just after the murder of Gina Amini, I found this note in my daughter's journal, which she kindly gave me permission to share with you all today. And it says, Iran is fighting against the government. It's not fair. I'm sad because of it. My daughter also told me that during the school day, she was quietly saying slogans she heard at the protest she had attended in Seattle. Seeing her writing led me to pause around her sadness. I shared with her that she's not alone in her sadness and fear and that many people are also feeling deeply hopeful about what is unfolding. I showed her texts from family members living in Iran who had expressed deep hope about the possibilities for change. I also shared with her that our imaginations are really strong and can see and make a different world. I think this connects to some of the other comments and thinking about what Catherine shared um, towards the end as well. Um, she and I are also now engaged in a conversation around gender, women's rights, and feminism in ways that I see shaping her sense of girlhood, what it means, and what it could mean. Um, and I share with her examples. So this is the other image I wanted to share. I share with her examples of children protesting, such as the three girls walking down the streets um, chanting Zan Zen Digi Azadi that came kind of iconic, um, or the young boys on the right who are mimicking um, Saida Piruman, the Iranian soccer player who gestured to be cutting his hair in solidarity with women. I think part of what's important about these openings for her and other children is growing up with the idea of such male solidarity with women as a given, not unusual, but to be expected. I also show her images like this one um, that help make connections between what she knows and has learned about struggles for freedom in the United States, especially for her as a black Iranian child, with struggles for freedom in Iran. And I think these transnational connections can be really powerful for children and help them think about deeper forms of solidarity across different oppressed communities and parts of the world, which I think also connects to what Shahzad was sharing. Um, so let me see if I can, I think that stopped the share. Okay, so I think it's important. Um, hold on, give me a moment to fix my screen. Okay, there we go. Um, so, I think it's important to um, assume um, that that children are paying close attention to the stress that many families are experiencing, to the ways that we're following the news, and to not assume that shielding them from the news is necessarily a healthier response. I think it's important to create space for kids to ask their real questions and to answer them in ways that are um, appropriate for their age and also authentic to our own honest thoughts and feelings. Um, I think kids feel safe when they know we can hold their difficult feelings. And right now for a lot of Iranian children in particular, that might include fear and anxiety about their family and community safety, grief over lives lost, including the lives of children and youth in Iran, feelings of anger in response to injustice, um, ethical and political questions and concerns that may feel new to them, um, and questions about their role and identities. Um, I think attending or reading about protests can help kids know that they're not alone and to sense the power of collective action. Um, one of the conversations attending protests with my own daughter opened up is the idea that many Iranians are united in their desire to see the end of the Islamic Republic, but that there's a lot of different ideas and goals about what should come after. And we talked about how important it is for revolutions to not only move from what we don't want or are working to dismantle, but deeply from what we are working to build. Um, I think this feels like for me, one of the deep lessons of 79 that is part of her uh, political inheritance as well. 
So in the last few minutes, I just want to transition. Those are some ideas about families of um, Iranian diasporic families in particular. And I want to offer some ideas that might be helpful for K-12 educators and university educators as well. Um, so first, with important exceptions, likely among the educators who are on this call, there's often a lack of attention to complex social and historical analysis in K-12 schools beyond kind of singular or dominant narratives. Um, I think there's also a particular culture of debate and dialogue in the United States that tends to focus on two sidesism and um, and I think this is something I tend to name at the outset of all my undergraduate classes and try to scaffold students to move beyond in terms of how they hear and engage with one another's ideas and with the text. And that is that I often talk about how we've been socialized to agree or disagree with each other and to agree or disagree with text as like the first move. And I try to open up all the other ways that we can engage with each other's ideas and with, and with concepts from the readings. Um, and I think that helps to do what Ruzbe was naming, um, which is to reason beyond binaries or either or thinking and to wrestle with complexity. And that's a phrase that I've learned from Kara Lee. I have to I have to give credit where it's due, where she always talks about wrestling with complexity as a core kind of practice of critical civics and learning across the disciplines. And I think that's really valuable here. So I'm going to offer a few examples that have already been touched on. Obviously, there's the flattening of anti-compulsory hijab movements into Islamophobia, with Kat which Catherine alluded to, in ways that prevent us from thinking about multiple forms of patriarchy and how it's expressed. Um, I think there's also the tension that Catherine raised around increasing life chances, health and literacy of women alongside a deeply patriarchal legal regime of gender apartheid, like how do we make sense of those side by side, it requires a kind of wrestling with complexity. And I think there's also a tendency for those who speak out against Western intervention or sanctions to automatically be seen as pro regime, especially right now, in ways that prevent us from holding the internal authoritarianism and repression of the Islamic Republic and the United States longstanding and self-interested interference in militarism in the region, both of which I think actively thwart the life-giving possibilities held by the slogan Zan Zendigi Azadi. So I think there's deep lessons to be learned here about revolutions themselves and how they can push forward certain political possibilities while reproducing domination in other forms. And I think Iran is not alone in that kind of historic dynamic, and it's one human communities are actively learning how to engage with and push beyond. Um, the second point that might be useful for educators involves, I think, the deep lessons we can learn from current Iranian struggles around mass civil disobedience and refusal, including how we can learn to see more clearly what is being held together by our collective compliance that is in fact malleable and deeply possible to change. And I think young people in particular are thinking about this all the time. So not only around compulsory hijab, but gender segregation itself as seen in young people in Iran breaking down the walls between segregated spaces or simply sitting outside to eat together at the university in a way that disrupts um, gender segregation. So I think one of the pedagogical practices here is to help young people think about how bravery is not an individual feat, but a collective phenomena and a process through which people are witnessing each other's courage and teaching one another what it means to imagine and enact the possible in the present. Um, as others have mentioned, something I think we could learn from in this country, especially given the overturning of Roe v. Wade a few months ago. So the last point I wanted to make is that, and I think this connects in, a, in an interesting way to Shahzad's point, and I would love to have some discussion about this, is that I think it can be powerful to engage with students and young people about the relationships between social, political, and cultural change. So there's this idea that part of what we're witnessing is also a social revolution, and that regardless of the current like immediate political outcome, there's kind of a no going back that speaks to the potentials of a deeper cultural shift taking place that's not just about what's happening on the street, but also how people engage in the context of family, schools, public spaces, workspaces. Um, and I think we can see this in the school age girls that um, and their activism that Ruzbe alluded to, which Nazanina Shahrunni has called feminists in the making. Um, and in the stories of young women refusing to wear hijab in family gatherings where before they may have done so out of respect, there's lots of stories around, you know, um, a, a different forms of this that we can see, men fighting alongside women, elder women who may identify as more religious, supporting all women's rights to bodily autonomy. 
Um, so I wanna just emphasize the broader idea of feminism as a relational and ethical practice, um, which reminds us that there's a kind of everyday political activity um, that is also the realm of social change that's interwoven with, but distinct from the state as the object of kind of feminist activism. And um, part of the connection I see to what Shazar was sharing is that there is these global phenomena and connections to be made around capitalism, imperialism. Um, and, and I think that relationship between scales of change and where political struggle happens at the macro and micro level is one of the ways that we might support young people to make those connections. Um, so I think this perspective reminds us to ask questions like, how are people changing as human beings in and through such political struggle? in ways that make other systems and worlds possible. This is obviously an echo of Paulo Freire, Gracie Boggs, um, Bell Hooks, and many others who have asked this question. Um, so I wanted to end there and transition us um, to the Q&A. So I'm gonna kind of try to draw a bridge and I know there's some questions coming up in the chat as well. Um, so I'm gonna start us off with a question and then um, I hope people can continue to put their questions into the Q&A. Um, and that we can kind of try to weave these together. Um, so the question I wanted to start with for the panel, and I hope we can have some discussion um, collectively, um, is to think about um, the kind of terms or grounds through which we understand what is taking shape in Iran. And I think people have been alluding to this um, and what it can look like to study and learn about Iran on its own terms, which is itself kind of polyvocal and complex. Um, another way to say this is how can we support educators and young people to take kind of a meta reflective view of our own knowledge on Iran and where it comes from. Um, obviously in spaces like the United States and maybe other Western contexts, there's these strong kind of negative characterizations of Iran that have frames around terrorism and these kinds of access of evil kind of things that young people have also absorbed in many cases. And so how do we as part of our pedagogical practice, create an awareness around those existing frames um, and think about learning and knowledge production itself as a political act that I think um, is entangled with particular values and purposes. So I wanna open that up as we dig into the Q&A to the panel and see if folks might wanna comment on that um, as a first kind of question. I'm, I'm happy to uh, wade into that uh, excellent question, Shirin. Um, so, um, yeah, I think there's a couple of points to hit on here. And uh, in thinking about this, I'm, I'm kind of going back to an ethnography that I did several years ago in two high schools in, in the U.S. And, and during that project, I saw a lot of teachers using the graphic novel Persepolis and different classrooms and uh, content areas that year. And uh, the teachers were using the text in, in heterogeneous ways, which resulted in different outcomes, um, many of which actually ended up uh, reproducing the kinds of problematic representations that I think uh, several of us have talked about the need to, to disrupt and create alternatives for. So um, I think one of the, the first points uh, that's really important for us as educators uh, is to be clear about the aims and intent of a conversation or a unit and to connect those aims and concepts to the specific context that we're talking about. So letting students know that there's a, a larger context for a unit, that there are in fact dominant understandings that people are drawing upon to make sense of Iran or uh, many other places for that, for that matter, and that those understandings uh, can work to inform our conversations, our opinions, and you know, in the larger picture and aggregate, uh, politics and, and policy engagements, and then explaining to students the importance of why we need uh, alternate understandings that go beyond those representations that are available to us. And I spent a lot of time um, observing the classroom of an English teacher who really wanted to highlight different struggles for justice through the literature that they were teaching. And even though they had stated that they were teaching Persepolis as part of a larger unit on imperialism, colonialism, and, and revolutions, uh, the scaffolding of those terms was uneven and not always clear. And I think this is really important because the, these terms like empire and imperialism typically aren't part of the conversations that happen in teacher education spaces, nor are they particularly common in K-12 education in, U in the U.S. either. And so despite there being a lot of historical and multidisciplinary research and inquiry 
on the topic and specifically on the US as an imperial power. Um, so without that historical grounding, um, the conversations in the classroom often lacked connections to the historical events in Iran and um, the role of the US in Iranian politics that I think would have allowed students a, a greater understanding of, of those concepts. And, I, and real quickly, that brings me to um, a, a, a second point, which is along with stating our aims and providing the contextual and historical foundations to support them, it's important to uh, assess where we're starting from. Uh, what are the understandings of Iran and U.S.-Iran relations that you're bringing with you into this unit? Of the U.S., for that example, uh, you know, latent commitments to U.S. exceptionalism. Where do those understandings come from? Um, in the classrooms that uh, I was working in, I didn't see a lot of discussion uh, on those or, or, or those types of questions or how those representations of Iran uh, became dominant or how they get reproduced and why it's important to interrupt those representations. So even when um, students are trying to discover more information about the history of Iran on their own, they're not really considering, there weren't considerations provided to them on how to assess the information that they were finding online, and then trying to incorporate that into individual and group work. And this resulted in students creating informational posters uh, about Iran that claimed that the dominant language of uh, Iran is Arabic, or that the revolution in Iran was an Islamic revolution or that before 1979, women were free and could wear whatever they wanted. And I think we need to be able to both qualify and critically engage with these claims, especially when they're not correct. And not in order to shame students as being wrong, but just to inquire, hey, where does this, where did the, where does this come from? Um, relatedly, there weren't conversations about how students are bringing unexamined commitments to US exceptionalism into how they approach the text and the, the larger histories that it can introduce to students. And so when we look at um, gender inequity and the repression of political dissent and how that happens in Iran, there's a tendency for many North American and European observers to, to say that people there are oppressed and want to be free. And by free, the subtext is that they want to be like, like us. And, and that's problematic for a couple of reasons. I think first, because it infantilizes the political agency and imagination of Iranians and the specificity of their political demands across protest movements. And secondly, claiming that they wanna be free like us, again, whitewashes and dehistoricizes the terms and conditions of political life here in the US or in France, uh, here in the US where uh, black and brown people are disproportionately policed and incarcerated, where white supremacy is normalized in political discourse, where the integrity of elections is, is interfered with, where the Supreme Court overturned settled law by uh, providing protection for women's bodily sovereignty. And states are litigating what can be taught and said about racism and sexuality and histories of slavery and settler colonialism in the classroom. So the point that I'm trying to make is that equating the political demands of Iranian protesters for greater freedoms with a longing to be like us um, is a possibility for us, an opportunity for us as educators to attempt to really reconcile how the terms of freedom uh, in the U.S. are heavily classed, racialized, gendered, and not on offer for all people. And I'll stop there because there's more to say, but we don't have time and I wanna to get to the other questions. I wanna make space, thank you for that, Uzba. I wanna make space for Catherine and Shahzad as well, Sarah as well, if anybody has thoughts about um, kind of terms of knowledge and how we support critical reflection on where our knowledge about Iran is taking shape. Um, I, I can go and, and thank you so much to both you and, and, and Andrew Spare for very thoughtful comments and, 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 and uh, suggestions that, that you made. I want to, uh, in responding to this question, I just want to add two very quick points to what um, Roosevelt laid out here for us. I remember that um, in, in the 70s, uh, when I was late 70s, when uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, um, usually I was a woman um, of Iran. And uh, with the defeat of, of the revolution and, and the beginning of, of the suppression in, in the 80s, I had to return as, as exile, political exile, back to the same campus in, in 83. So when I came back, I became a Muslim woman. 
And I think that, and, and, and in a body of, of, of the feminist literature, uh, women of the Arab world, women of, of, of the Middle East, they all became women of, of Muslim majority countries. These are not accidental, and, and these are not sort of, of, of a uh, only identitarian renaming. It is a renaming that is deeply political and deeply also um, creating this myth that to this day we are trying to, we are trying to uh, very hard to sort of uh, demystify and, and, and also provide uh, another explanation for it. And I think that as educators, it is very important to re-educate ourselves. These are theoretical positions and a lot of, of a different forms of our bodies of, of knowledge and, and theories that were created gave us the, the tools in order to really uh, sort of, of, of enabled us to have very fragmentary and, and delinked. This is going against what we are all talking about, relationality, understanding the connections, interconnectedness. But what, what was given to us was very much a fragmenting body of, of knowledge in terms of, of separation of, of body from society, separation of, of, of social relations, politics, economy, and, and, and also giving us a very euphemistic tools in order to understand the world. So then we started translating all those uh, complex theoretical uh, tools that we were given in into also our, our pedagogy or our knowledge and, and, and our classroom practices, which were very alienating. It didn't help the teachers nor the students because it did not uh, respond to the reality of, of what was uh, being experienced uh, by them. So going back to the point that also Catherine made in, in terms of the historicization, I mean, the historicization of understanding a long century of women's resistance, not only Iran, but throughout the, the Middle East. The fact that the Middle East has experienced the socialist feminist group, communist women's groups, women that were uh, engaged in armed struggle, that history has erased from even understanding of, you know, explaining the post-1970 uh, nine Iran, bringing that rich history, not glorifying it, understanding the, the pitfalls and the problems of the left, the patriarchy within all these organizational structures, it actually enriches our practices today. And la one, one last point that I want to make. And this is my challenge as an educator. This binary of East-West, we really need to bring an end to this. East is, does not exist without the West and then nor does West without the East. They create each other and they create this condition that we observe in, in the world. We really have to break this binary and, and, and be able to explain it. One way that when I tell my students that imagine in order to understand the struggle of women in Iran, I am of the generation that my mother, 87 years old, witnessed the forced unveiling of her mother and the forced veiling of her daughter and has been continuous struggle in, in, in between. And I really think that this historicization, breaking this binary of, of East and West, these are, are the sort of a um, um, unmystifying Iran and, and the Middle East and understanding Iran also in the context of, of the Middle East is part of, of that feminist transnational relational understanding that, that uh, we need to bring into our, our classrooms and, and, and our, our teaching. Thank you. Um, so with that, I think we can get into our second question. Uh, 
And in conjunction with a question from the audience, thank you very much. Um, we wanted to connect the point that Ruzbe made that we need to learn from students and teachers in Iran who are politicizing sites of education and Shirin's point that dialogue about politics in the US has its own forms and limitations. Um, could we connect these to discuss how we might shift our dialogue about the protests here if we do listen to youth and students in Iran? And how do we see the significance of young people's role in what's taking shape in Iran currently? And how might it be important for young people outside of Iran to connect with the centrality of youth in the current revolutionary uprisings? I mean, I, I can start, although I don't, I don't, I think probably other people have, have more expertise, um, but, um, I mean, I, I, I think the youth piece is so crucial and so critical. Um, I think it's part of, part of why the struggle feels different from, from past struggles. It feels like a departure. Um, I mean, I'm not a media scholar, but obviously social media is significant here. Um, the fact that I think young people in Iran <clears throat> Are, are connected to the world in, in a particular kind. I mean, the, the truth is people in Iran have always been connected to the world and part of the world. There's no place that's not a part of the world. So I think that's always something to emphasize all, you know, Iran is of the world, it's of the same time frame <laughs> that the rest of the world is in. Um, but, but I do think that, I mean, for me, it feels like there's a, a this is the paradoxical moment that we live in where, young people have inherited, created, internalized, grown up drinking as if it's like in the water, you know, fluoride in the water, really deep and beautiful ideas about each other, about how to treat and be with each other, about um, gender, about the, you know, the sort of fiction of gender and race and all of these categories on the one hand. Of course, this is not all young people, but if we need to kind of make some general statements, young people everywhere, I think, are being different with each other. They have different kind of understandings and sensibilities about things that's a product of, you know, many people coming before them and trying to change the world and changing consciousness. So there have been these like deep, profound, I feel like kind of global shifts in understanding among young people. We see young people at the kind of head as is always the case of so many movements around climate change, you know, around um, dismantling white supremacy, kind of global white supremacy, um, uh, you know, just all of these beautiful, incredible, things that are happening simultaneously alongside of, you know, just incredible forms of death and violence and destruction. And, you know, how are, how are these connected to each other? But, but I think that's one thing to kind of think about, you know, that as young people, uh, you know, sorry, you raise this or have so much anxiety about all of these things, they also have created I think new ways of being with each other that are so instructive and educational. And we're, I think we learn from our students all the time, like sort of what they know, what they know from the everyday and kind of growing up in a particular moment and the, the practices with each other. Of, of course, again, this is not to romanticize them. They're not living in these utopias, but they're, they're just, there, there's something about, I think, the ways that many young people are with each other that's really important. And I think we see this in a lot of the, um, the graffiti, the song, the art, the practices of being together on the street. And, and again, in my estimation, a lot of this is informed by the, the fact that feminism has deeply penetrated. Feminism and other kinds of liberation ideas have penetrated many, many parts of society, even as we're losing, like we're losing so much, you know, we're being defeated, we're 
we're losing in all these places. So um, I, I think that's just something to emphasize, you know, that young people are creating a new world. They have been creating a new world. And also that students historically have, have been at the kind of forefront of so many incredible movements globally. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think that's something many students know in other places in the US, we have to teach that history a lot, right, to our own students about the fact that they, students, their age group, their kind of particular political formation is, is so important. Can I just say something about the youth that uh, Catherine was, was, was talking about, which I, I think it is important. I, I really think that they, um, you know, major international agencies from World Bank to UNESCO, UNICEF, um, and many NGOs are really capitalizing on, on the youth, on their alienation, on, on their sense of, of despair, and, and, and also alternatively putting them in, in this notorious concept that has been used, you know, it's becoming a buzzword on resiliency and then youth resiliency, all the programs around resiliency, cultural programs around resiliency, and then the political program around resiliency, which means that putting the uh, understanding and then also getting up of the misery, the violence, the racism, everything that they are experiencing on them. So what we are talking about here is, is that actually is, is an alternative to this model of global resiliency that it is happening. Youth in Iran are getting up the ground, the explosion of artistic expression of, of their uh, suffering is, should be very inspiring. And now this is the moment that we sort of, of, of bring back this notion of youth resistance and, 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 and also the connectivity and, and again, this relationship between youth of the world that they need to uh, sort of, of, of really get at the roots of what is happening in, in their lives. And, and what is connecting all these uh, suffering that, or or even the sense of, of despair that they are experiencing. The limits of the notion of this liberal bourgeois democracy, that the, the entire life, it means that you have choices, but these choices are not life-giving choices. These are not choices in, in order to create a sense of collectivity, a sense of responsibility. It's a survival. It's a survival and it is, it's very sort of, of, of uh, limited uh, to the self at the expense of the society and at the expense of collectivity. And I think that really this sort of, this is, this will be a very hopeful message for the youth in, in order to be able to do that. And let me also, and by you know giving a shout out to Mike Davis, who recently uh, unfortunately passed away, in his last book, and on more than seven hundred pages of only looking at the rising of, of, of the people in a southern part of, of California for over a, a summer months of, of resistance on racism, on colonialism, on capitalism he is paying for the first time attention to not only high school students, but uh, sorry, to university students, but high, the role of the high school students and teachers in creating this sense of, of a uh, resistance and also understanding the condition of racism to capitalism and, 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 and uh, um, uh, teaching uh, the entire, um, um, tiered educational system, segregation, uh, segregation and, and, and all of that. It's a very inspiring piece of work for us to go back and then see that what teachers were doing and, and also what the students' resistance was. As much as we are advocating here, 
and I think that rightly so, for the historicization of the situation in Iran, for our educational purposes here, we also need to historicize the, the, the educational system in Iran and in, in wherever we are in, in, in North America. The question of indigenous people, the question of, of, of the, the rights of, of um, uh, suppressed racialized communities, I think that it is, it's also important that we historicize and, 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 and also connect. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Shahzad. Um, I wanna offer a thought or two about this question and then transition us to the next question. So um, as, as you all were speaking, there's two kind of ideas that came to my mind in response to what you posed, Sarah. One is, and I think this speaks to what is um, potentially deeply hopeful about what is happening that we can learn from. And when I say hope, I mean a kind of radical world-making hope, right? Um, and, and one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is um, whenever I see the videos and images of school-age kids, high school, middle school, younger kids um, protesting in Iran or, you know, refusing gender segregation or um, the images that Ruzbe showed, one of the things I ask myself is, how are they learning together? Um, and I think that those expressions of political vision and activism are fruits of knowing that there are deep spaces of learning environments among young people that I think we can learn a lot from. And that connects to the other part of what I wanted to share about the hopeful piece, which is that Iran like all nation states, and I think that's important to say, is invested in a particular kind of education that is not nurturing critical thinking, as Shahzad alluded to earlier, and that there's actually a lot of energy put towards that um, education in a particular framework that supports kind of state policy and practice, and it is not successful. <laughs> and I think that that's really important for us to understand. And I think this connects to Julia's comments, some of the things that are coming up in the United States around, you know, the, the attempt to, to close off any discussion of race and white supremacy in U.S. schools is similar to efforts by other nation states to prevent critical discourse and dissent, and it is deeply unsuccessful. And that, I think, is where I get hope from, because I think young people's experiences of the world will always be more powerful than propagandistic narratives that are kind of um, invested in and, and pushed for in schools. And so that's kind of one piece that I wanted to offer around that. And then I think there's there's two um, things that I worry about that I'm going to share as worries um, related to Shahzad's critique of, of resilience. I think it's a really important critique of the resilience framework. And I think the two things I worry about is the ways that we sometimes within critical pedagogies and discourses on social movements romanticize youth-led um, movements and that's not to diminish the powerful role of young people. I hope that's come across in what I'm saying, but there's a risk here. And I think it goes back to Sara's earlier concern of like the burden that we also place on young people. And I think what it does is it sometimes closes off a discussion around intergenerational learning and intergenerational activity within social movements. And there's lots of examples of that, including elders. I mean, the images of older women taking off their hijab in saying this is in solidarity with our young people. Um, I think there's bi-directional forms of intergenerational learning. Our conversation about historicizing the current movements in Iran is also a conversation inside Iran that often plays out across generations and the ways that they, sorry, um, the ways that they talk with each other and learn with each other. So I think there's there's a, what I see as um, there's a piece here about intergenerational learning, and then I think that connects to the language, and I won't open up a whole can of worms, but I think it's important to say the language of leaderlessness and the question of leadership, I think is a complex one that connects to this. Um, and so people have talked about leaderless movements, some people talk about leaderful movements, is my aunt calling me again? Um, so I will stop there and kind of transition us um, to the to the question um, that I want to pose for the panel. Um, 
So, so there's two actually questions that I'm going to connect. One comes from Tiffany, who said, um, thank you all. I'm so intrigued by the political agency of teachers. What are the state structures that shape teacher pre-service learning? When and how are communities of dissent among teachers supported? Um, and I want to connect that to questions that Julia is raising around teachers in the United States who might receive pushback from parents about pushing our political agendas on kids. So I think those are kind of two sides of the same coin in terms of dealing with different states and their control of teaching and the spaces of possibility that exist in Iran as well as in the United States. So I wanna open up that question. Yeah, I think um, that uh, to, to go back to, to, to the, um, kind of role of uh, teacher labor associations. I think that's one of the really important spaces where these um, kind of practices of dissent or uh, the notion of, of like a constituency of teachers as a political constituency really takes takes shape. Um, it's important to mention that, you know, they're, they're, the practice of like independent labor uh, trade unions, for example, is, is heavily limited in Iran. Um, and that labor organizations are often kind of under the auspices of uh, some sort of uh, semi-autonomous, semi-kind of dependent uh, relation to the state. So um, the fact that teachers themselves, along with, you know, uh, contract-based oil workers, along with uh, people who are working in, in uh, sugar mills, along with bus drivers, are creating these labor associations and, in a sense, charting what those spaces entail, um, you know, this kind of uh, iterative building of like an us or of a political constituency. I think that's happening in spaces that are either um, not directly kind of created by the state or or licensed, sanctioned by the state, or, or they're they're kind of being repurposed by the participants themselves. And I think that's really important for us to think about in relation to um, teaching here as well too. There's a lot of work that's come out, like really brilliant work that's come out just in terms of like the blind spots or maybe some of the silences or the places where teacher education in the US needs to kind of do more or incorporate more um, transnational understandings into, into uh, the kinds of training and support that they're providing to teacher candidates as well too. And there's something to be said for locating that work or that kind of conscious building, that kind of political awareness building within the institution. But I think that, um, and now I'm just really thinking extemporaneously right now, one of the things that's important and I think is exemplified by um, what we're doing here today and what a lot of other folks are trying to do and trying to offer spaces of reflection and, and interrogation to, to think about this is the, the spaces of learning, the spaces of kind of possibility that exist people are going to create them. There are, those spaces are iterative, those spaces kind of uh, materialize uh, and not necessarily under the auspices or uh, with, with the supervision of um, state actors. And so I, I think that it's important for us to kind of hang on to the possibility of creating um, our own uh, kinds of relationalities and with that kind of this notion of spatialities, like the social meanings associated with the space. Um, and intervening in those ways, I think, can allow for us to have the conversations, build the kind of collectivities that we need, even when there's not necessarily an institutional uh, blueprint or something that's being um, held available by, by existing arrangements. I probably have nothing to um, offer in terms of how teachers are navigating this, but I wanted just to speak briefly to the, I think the concern about youth. Should I do that here or should I wait until we? Okay. Okay. Um, Cause I think that's such a, that was such a great concern. Um, and I was thinking about it as you're kind of posing that, like, I think what feels, um, I think, you know, uh, capacious or generative about this moment in Iran, and I think globally too is, um, I mean, it feels like part of why it's youth in Iran, many people have said this, is 
they their references are just different than than the references of people even in 2009 the one million signatures campaign and the post-revolutionary decades like they don't feel that they need to respond to and it hasn't been their world right where they're like oh we're the we're the daughters and mothers of the revolution and you know that the distance from the revolution and post-revolution for them is very great and i think that that is part of why that that kind of um, compulsion to work within the parameters of the state and the state's discourse, you know, about um, <clears throat> about Islam, they don't they don't feel that the same pressures. And I think that that is maybe a link to some of the other sorts of um, youth or student led protests around the world, just feeling like their world and the kind of political language that has been offered them about here's here's this narrow political machine that you can work within. Um, they're challenging that, you know, and so in that way, I think that they're you that the, the moment at which they become politicized around something is really significant and important and what's the, the kind of vision of how to be a political actor um has been so thin and impoverished and i think they recognize that and i think that's maybe a connection to draw out and then it connects to i think that this this question of okay what's the container for for the the ongoingness of the revolt in iran and the us you know in in ukraine like wherever we're talking about in latin america um you know what what is the structure? Is there a structure? You know, um, what's the what's the relationship between scaling up, right? And you know, we know from our own experience in the U.S., like the political machine is so disciplining. It just says, "Here's what's possible," and um, and you know, we try to challenge that in, in a lot of different ways. And I think it will be interesting to see what unfolds in Iran. You know, there's so many different possibilities. Um, but, you know, to have that conversation, of, I think with students also is really interesting to them. Like, you know, it's been framed as the reform revolution question, but I think even moving beyond that frame, like what, what, what do we imagine ourselves? How do we imagine ourselves in terms of governing our, you know, governance, the larger political structure, how we are with each other, what that looks like at these different scales is really a conversation I think feminists have always been invested in, always been talking about, you know, not just the relationship to the state, but what kind of state or the, you know, the abolition, like all of these debates. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for that to have that kind of transnationally or globally because of the particular moment that we're in that Sharzad laid out about, you know, neoliberal kind of dominance and environmental destruction and patriarchal, I mean, not just patriarchy, but militarized patriarchy that we see in all of these forms, including all the shootings happening here. So, um, yeah. I want to, um, pose maybe one final question in the time that we have. Um, and then uh, after engaging with this question, uh, perhaps we'll end with a song that uh, Shahrzad wants to share after we re-engage uh, with this round of questioning. And so uh, this one, uh, great questions from, the, uh, from those of you in attendance. Thank you for reflecting and engaging so closely with, with everything that's been said. And, and I think this is one that's worth thinking about as well, too. And it says, one of the things that I've been struggling with as an educator and member of the Iranian diaspora is the politically conservative current of uh, the diaspora. And at the same time, many of the progressive left-leaning media that I've historically relied on have been deeply disappointing. I'm wondering what the suggestions are from the panelists for taking this reality into consideration as we walk into our classrooms, knowing that what the majority has access to are quite different from what's being discussed here today. Yeah. 
maybe I, I, I will just say very briefly that um, this is part of the struggle and it should be understood as, as part of the struggle. It's a political struggle, needs explanation and it won't go away. But I think that it is important to um, and, you know, address it in, in the sense that, I mean, as a Marxist feminist, I will put it as, as uh, in, the, in the context of class struggle. This is the struggle of ideas and class positions, ideology, knowledge, consciousness. Where does that come from? And we need to acknowledge it. We cannot dismiss it. It is the reality and it is the reality for the history and then every well and uh, uh, you know every every other struggle too in the context of, of of the us as most of you are located there are many different uh, opinions about uh, the history of, of of racism and colonialism and imperialism of the us and then uh, when there is a shooting and the killing of of, of a black body there are many different analyses of it, many different groups with different uh, political agenda that will organize around it. So I think that all of it is not accidental. It is part of, of, of the human society with different ideas that is also the society that it is deeply uh, class on, on uh, is divided on, 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 on uh, class lines. And, and the class is, is not an economic position, it's social relations. And, and therefore understanding it in the context of, of social relations, of gender, race, class, sexuality, and, and, and in the context of history, all of the things that we have been talking about is very important. It is hard, it requires much thinking and, and, and much uh, sort of, of, of a, um, organizing and, and building the communities and learning. I, I think that as educators, we also need to create and then go back to the beautiful practices of Black Panthers to create, you know, reading circles, to organize in, in where we are and, and um, start really conversations, something exactly the, the mode of critical analysis, critical thinking, and, and that has been taken away from, from uh, our educational system in, in the West as uh, also, in, in terms of a, this, this much competition, competitive individual, that it is only being tra trained in order to manage self from crisis to debt, to building, uh, you know, uh, herself, uh, for, for living in, in this society. We need to overcome all of that. And, and uh, the division in the diaspora is, is, is in Iranian diaspora is, is part of it because we are all rooted in it uh, differently. So I, I, I think that I will use it as an educational moment and um, I value that, that opportunity. Yeah, just to build on that briefly, Shahzad, I appreciate that so much. And I think um, for non-Iranian young people who may have absorbed some of the ideas that exist in our society about Iran and the broader region, I think this is an opportunity, right? Like if we think about like, well, this Iranian person said this, and then this other Iranian person said this totally other thing about what's going on. It's like, yeah, right? So the degree of kind of dehumanizing and flattening that happens that leads to a conundrum like that, I think is an opportunity to understand where those understandings are coming from and to think about connections across groups and the deep internal heterogeneities of political thought within all human communities as Shahzad was alluding to. For Iranian kids, I think it's also helpful to create space to wrestle with this from the perspective of some of us have all these perspectives within our families, right? And how do we think about how, you know, this uncle is yelling at that person and this is all, this is what young people are witnessing oftentimes, not always, and wrestling with. And I think can, can have support in asking questions like, how did this person that, that I love and care about come to think about the world this way? 
And how did this other person that I love and care about think come to think about the world this way? There are answers to those questions in our families. And so I think that that kind of inquiry and sense of wonder about how do these ideas come to be? How do these stances come to be? I think can be helpful, especially for young people navigating. Um, and I wanna, I wanna be mindful of time and I also wanna create space. Um, I know there's